Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And you could see from the title, Dual Energy CT Angiography and 3D Imaging of Vascular Lesions of the Hand and Forearm Beyond Trauma. And this was an RSNA exhibit from two years ago, or 18 months ago, or maybe 13 months ago to be exact. And this is something we're putting together actually as a submission for emergency radiology. But I thought it's something that we should speak about. And the objectives of this talk are kind of easy provide an overview of the use of dual energy CT angio and the acquisition technique, review some of the standard vascular anatomy of the hand and arm, focusing on its CT appearance, and then define the utility of dual energy CT angiography and 3D imaging in evaluating what are often very complex uh, processes. Now, we know that the indications for CTA continue to grow in dual energy we speak about vascular dual energy, that it should be done in every case when you're doing extremities. Regardless of the cause, it makes it easier to remove bone and it makes it easier to create really good vascular maps. And of course, we've spoken about this previously mainly as it relates to trauma. Gunshot wounds, stab wounds, you name the trauma. But this talk is going to focus on things maybe you don't think about because they're non-trauma. A quick review. Uh, Dual energy CT can be done either with two x-ray tubes or a single x-ray tube. Uh, the semen scanner uses two x-ray tubes, GE one x-ray tube. We are either doing 80 and 140 KVP simultaneously or in the newer scanners, 80 and 150. So you require two sets of images from the region of interest. You have simultaneous energy acquisitions which allow comparison of material specific differences in attenuation. And the higher the molecular weight of material, the greater the absorption differences between high and low kilovoltage acquisitions due to the increased likelihood of a photoelectric effect at lower KVP. Now, with dual energy, there are many advantages. Some of them are automated bone removal, metal artifact reduction, improved characterization of iodine contrast enhancement with contrast dose reduction opportunities, particularly in the lower extremity. It makes 3D processing more efficient, particularly if you do automated bone removal. And there are also ways of doing radiation dose reduction. And one of the ones you think about with dual energy, of course, is virtual non-contrast. And some people have used it. It's not been as successful, perhaps, as people were hoping, but it is there. So let's now look specifically at the arm. So think about the anatomy. You have the subclavian artery on the left to the axillary to the brachial. You track the brachial down, and then it divides to the ulnar and radial artery. There's a common interosseous artery. As you follow things further down, you follow the radial and ulnar arteries, and then they come together at the deep palmar arch. There's also a superficial palmar arch, and then you follow the vessels down into the digits. All sorts of pathology from uh, uh, diabetes to vasculitis can affect these vessels. Now when you look at it on a big picture, here is the subclavian and we even have some color. The subclavian in yellow goes to the green which is the axillary which becomes the brachial artery and you could see that very nicely. There's a volume rendered with the bone still in place but again very nice visualization. And then of course you track from that set of images down a little bit and you can see with two different just rotations, uh, the ability to follow the brachial to the ulna and radial, and that common interosseous artery. So a good example of the CT 3D imaging matching the line drawings. Now, like all vessels, there are variations. Uh, a high origin of the radial artery from the axillary artery or upper brachial artery is an uncommon one. High origin of the ulna is much less common. Duplication of the brachial artery and hypoplasia uh, or aplasia of the radial and ulnar arteries are rare variants. And persistent median artery supplying the palmar arch can occur in a few percent of cases. And just to show you that, here's a nice example of a high takeoff of the radial artery or the ulnar artery, this persistent median artery. Uh, and again, those are variations. Typically, you're not going to... Uh, confuse it with pathology. You may not be used to the variations, but uh, get used to them. But it's probably not going to be a problem. Now, 
how do you do the studies? It depends a little bit what you're looking for. Most of the studies are arterial phase only with bolus trigger. But for things like AVMs, you may want to do a venous phase imaging, and surely you do in that application. And we do, it's very important when you do the studies to make sure the patients are very comfortable. The worst thing is patients moving during the study. If you force the patient in a position they're not comfortable with, you're going to have a problem. And here's some typical scan parameters, 120 kVp. We often use 100. Point, you'll see the pitch. You'll also see that we're doing 0.75 millimeter thick sections every 0.5. You also know the importance of injection rate. Five cc's a second is ideal. We, depending on the application, we'll go for the contralateral side just to minimize the amount of artifact present. And we reconstruct with bone and soft tissue acquisitions. So that works out very nicely. And the thins, of course, are the critical acquisitions when you're going to do all of the post-processing. Now, you can have artifact. Again, if patients move, you can get all sorts of artifacts. You know that from trauma where it looks like vessel occlusion or laceration, you have to make sure the patient is comfortable. As long as they're comfortable and they're in the scanner gantry, I could reconstruct any view I want. So I'm not that concerned about how the position's arm is. I am concerned about if they move. We want homogeneous enhancement. So fast injections are really good. Bolus tracking works well. You can have blooming artifact that can lead to overestimation of stenosis in the presence of calcification or the issues you have with metal. And that's more of a problem, of course, in patients with gunshot wound. Um, things we do to kind of minimize that, wide bone level settings, sharp kernel for reconstruction to reduce the blooming artifacts, dual energy plaque and metal removal techniques are also things, things that can be done. So let's look at some examples. 48-year-old male, uh, idiopathic CD4 lymphocytopenia, presents with right arterial thrombosis. You can see it very nicely, particularly on the image. You can see the thrombose vessel, really clearly seen. Again, sometimes the soft tissues work well to give you a better feel of where you are, but you have both of them routinely. In this case, the patient has an AV fistula, and we see a lot of these patients for hemodialysis. The following ligation of this uh, fistula, he noticed a growing mass in the wrist. It occasionally would swell and it would hurt. He now presented to the ER what appeared to be an embolic event with pain and purple discoloration of the middle ring and small fingers of the left hand. And now what you see is when you look at the sequence of images, you can make the diagnosis on the axial. There's a pseudoaneurysm. But look how nicely as you go from coronal to volume rendering to variations of the MIP and volume rendering with bone removal, how much nicer you can see where the aneurysm is, how the vessels go in and go out, and you can plan accordingly in patient management. Or in this example, this patient had cardiac cath via the radial artery. He has a nice example of a long segment occlusion of the right radial artery with distal reconstitution in the palmal arch. Again, that's not artifact, that's not motion, that's simply vessel occlusion. You can see in this example, we removed all the bone. The patient has a beautiful example of a radial artery pseudoaneurysm in the wrist. So again, preparing the images, acquiring the images, every single step from front to back is critical in making things happen. Now, transradial arterial access complications, arterial spasm and occlusion, uncommon are hematomas, radial artery perfs, AV fistula, nerve damage. Radial artery occlusion up to 38%. Hematomas, compartment syndrome, bleeding can cause compartment syndrome, but less than 1% of cases. Female sex, sheath size and procedure duration are key factors in this scenario. Radial artery perforation and pseudoaneurysms are both fortunately very rare. Here's a patient with a recent attempted pick placement. Now is an intramuscular hematoma and you can see active extravasation from the brachial artery. Again, removing the bone makes it very easy to see everything going on. Another example, here's a patient who had an arterial line placed by radial artery, who now has a radial artery pseudoaneurysm. You can see it very nicely, those two like lumps, it's almost like a bilobed pseudoaneurysm. Again, bone removal becomes critical, especially with MIP. 
but with any technique, it makes your set of images so much better. Or in this example, 26-year-old mixed connective tissue disorder, left hand pain, duskiness, decreased hand pulses. Look at the radial and ulnar arteries. You can see occlusion by thrombus of the radial artery. Just a beautiful example. Now we mentioned before about complications. Again, uh, most common complication of radial arterial line placement is temporary occlusion of the radial artery. Around 20% of patients get it, so it's not uncommon. Pseudoaneurysm, under 0.1%. Other complications, abscess, cellulitis, paralysis of the nerve, superior thromboarthritis, air embolism, compartment syndrome. Those are all things you need to worry about. Here's a nice example of a patient who has IV drug abuse, and you can see a brachial artery aneurysm, okay? Very nice example. Again, arms by the side, patient comfortable. You're able to create the images you need. So I just worry about the patient not moving, not specifically what uh, exact position they were in. Another example, 19-year-old with a right thinner eminence venous malformation presenting with increasing pain. And you can see this 4.8 centimeter vascular lesion, classic in appearance for a... Uh, vascular malformation. You can see the arterial and draining structures, and you can see that very nicely. Or in this example, a patient with end-stage renal disease has a large pseudoaneurysm. You'll notice that a lot of the patients we show you, these are not trauma patients, are complicated cases. They've had procedures for catheterization. They've had AV fistulas. They've had uh, grafts placed. So there's something that's compromising the vessel and these are the complications you're gonna see. Or this example, 26 year old with lupus and scleroderma presenting with chronic pain in her digits. We show interosseous artery and ulnar artery occlusion. And uh, you can see the superficial palmal branches from the ulnar artery not well visualized, this faint digital branches. And this is a vasculitis. So think about the complex patients who have symptoms Again, you see the beauty of bone removal from this dual energy data set. Or this example, a very nice fistula in this patient who, who has a fistula created for dialysis, but now there's stenosis in the fistula. You can see it very nicely. And I'll show you a few images, just a few different volume renderings to show the, the narrowing, and then show it to you here as well with cinematic rendering. And the cinematic rendering is a little bit more realistic a little better display, but you can see it very nicely here. And then here I'm going to take away the bone, and you can see very nicely the proximal and distal anastomosis. So very, very important diagnosis to be able to make. And again, non-invasively with the patient comfortable, 80 cc's of contrast to 100. Very simple study. So let's reach a few conclusions. One is dual energy CT angiography is a highly accurate, non-invasive diagnostic modality for evaluating patients with vascular abnormalities of the forearm and hand. And vascular pathology beyond classic trauma is well delineated in dual energy CT. And number three, for many of us, probably the most common time you're gonna be doing these studies is in the trauma setting. So again, when you're doing trauma, same principles apply. Patients comfortable, ideally contralateral injection, dual energy technique, bone subtraction, vascular mapping. So it's really repeating a point. Technique is everything. You don't need 10 cc's a second, you need five. You need a good IV placed. And uh, with that, I think you'll do a great job. And as a bonus, we've given you a few references. I expect you to read all those references, have them memorized. And next Wednesday or whenever it is, I'm going to give my next talk. I'll quiz you then. Have a great day. Bye.